cover to cover. And there's, sometimes you feel a special closeness to God. I don't know, the emotions may interact with the Holy Spirit and feeling that closeness sometimes. But I don't know that we, if, if God could reach down his hand and you could just reach up and grasp God's hand tonight, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? But, you know, probably the closest thing on this earth that we can have physically to touch from God is his blessed word. When we grasp this word in our hand, we're grasping the hand of heaven. This is his word. It can't be separated from him. It's part of God. His word is infallible. It's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And so when you hold his word in your hand tonight, you are kind of holding hands with God. We'll be in Genesis chapter 2, and then we're going to look at a couple of other verses to begin with. And uh, we'll also look in Ephesians 6, 4 and Proverbs 19, 18. If you can remember all those. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 2. Now, we had our split classes in the fall, and the ladies were having a class back there, and the men were having a class in here, and and uh, then along came the holidays, and the ladies' class teacher felt like that was a good time to have a baby. And so we were almost through with the classes uh, for our intentions for this fall and winter. And then the way things unraveled, I ended up having one more, one more message I wanted to bring to the men. And so ladies you have the blessed privilege of getting to listen to what your men were going to hear on that last lesson. I've got to get this one out of the, I got to get this one out there. It's the last one. I can't leave anything undone. I got to got to get it finished. And isn't it good if wives and husbands, if ladies and gentlemen and the children are all on the same page of the book when it comes to the family. And so we're talking about the discipline of children tonight and all the children said, "Amen. We're looking forward to that." And, and this is a mandate that men got directly from the beginning in the Garden of Eden. And, and it is effective and it is appropriate for all of us here tonight. Boys and girls, teenagers, men and women who have families or may have a family someday. You're single. Uh, grandparents, this is good for everybody. Genesis 2.15, we're going to see the mandate that God gave to men and included in this mandate, we believe, is the nurture and upbringing of the children as head of the family. Let's read chapter 2, verse number 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now what we've been saying to the men all through this series of messages is when God put the man in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it, he was supposed to work it and then protect it. Dress it and keep it. You know, you can, you can do something in preparation to have something, but then once you've got it, you have to keep it. I mean, you get a house, it needs a little upkeep, doesn't it? I mean, it's not like renting an apartment where the owner is taking care of everything. It's... Uh, it's something that needs upkeep. When you've got a car, you have to change the oil once in a while, put a little gas in it and tires on it, things like that. And so having it is one thing, but then keeping it is something else. And part of the man's mandate is in the Garden of Eden, it applies to all of life, is to dress it and keep it, to work it and protect it. Work it and keep it. It's like a garden. You can plant a garden, but then you've got to work it. And if you don't pull some weeds once in a while, you won't keep it. Isn't that right? It's going to go to the bugs and to the drought. Let's read also Ephesians 6, 4 in connection with this mandate that God placed upon the man. Even after the fall, the mandate, God's original design, did not change for man. There would have to be a remedy for sin, but the original mandate is still intact. Ephesians 6, 4 says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. 
I'm going to read one more time, and then we'll turn to Proverbs 19. Once more, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to the wrath, but bring them up. That's an active part of the family. I think one of the reasons we have so many failures in families today is because men have not lived up to their responsibility to bring up the kids, and the kids are just running wild through the neighborhood, and and uh, they've adopted, uh, families have adopted Hillary Clinton's uh, version of the family. It takes a village to raise a child. Well, that's not biblical. It takes a, a mom and a dad to raise a child. And then in Proverbs 19, 18, it says, Chasten thy son while there is hope. Chasten. That doesn't always mean taking a stick and working them over. Sometimes there's some verbal admonition that comes. Chasten thy son while there is hope. And watch this last part. And let not thy soul spare for his crying. Another proverb says he's not going to die. <laughs> when he needs discipline, you discipline him or her. Now they may act like they're going to die. They may try to cry out like they're going to die. But they're not going to die. You're not going to abuse them. You're going to discipline them, chasten them and you don't let your emotions interfere with God's mandate to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Let's pray and we'll get on with this. Father, I pray that you'd bless us tonight. Lord, draw our hearts close to thee. I pray that you'd help us as we hold your word in our hands that we would say, Lord, whatever you have for me to do, I'm willing. Lord, just tenderize my heart so that I might Heed your admonitions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've heard me say a number of times that I grew up in Izzard County. Graduated in high school there in, uh, in Mount Pleasant. It's called Mount Pleasant now. There's a post office. And a, well, it's a big, big town. We've got one convenience store and one little bank branch. That's all there is there as far as business goes. In the 18... Hundreds, late 1800s, a man by the name of Oscar P. Moore moved from Tennessee into Mount Pleasant. And he was established there a little bit later as a store owner. Back then, they had each little town had multiple general stores at one time, and if they were any size at all, because travel wasn't as easy back then. Well, Mr. Moore had two had two big general stores there in Mount Pleasant. This was back when it was a thriving metropolis. And so there were other, there, he owned a gin and he owned a blacksmith shop. And so he was, he, and he had a, 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 a grist mill where they would grind corn. And so all of those things were necessities then. And Mr. Moore sent his daughter off to Tennessee to go to college. And she wrote home after she got to college, back to Mount Pleasant, and she said, Dad, the kids over here at college are making fun of me because our town at that time was named Barren Fork, B-A-R-R-E-N, Barren Fork. And she said, they're making fun of me about the name of our town. She said, they're saying, you must really live in a horrid place. It must be harsh and uninhabitable, Barren Fork. She said, I'm so embarrassed that our town is called Barren Fork. Well... What Mr. Moore did, he got to thinking about it, and he thought, you know, it's not a very good name for a town, Barren Fork. Why would anybody want to live here according to that name? And so he went around to the other store owners and other business people in town, and he said, you know, she's called to my attention the fact that we're named Barren Fork, and that's not good. Uh, why don't we make it sound like something a little more pleasant? And so there was an academy there at the time, and it was named Mount Pleasant. And so they proposed changing the name from Barren Fork to Mount Pleasant. That sounds better, don't you think? Yeah, a little more pleasant. And so they got together and voted on it, and so they renamed the post office Mount Pleasant. Now, it had a nickname of Dry Town because most of the wells would go dry in the summertime, but it was never an official name. The official name was Barren Fork until Mr. Moore got the other business owners together and changed it to Mount Pleasant. You say, what's this got to do with child discipline? Well, would you rather your child be called barren and harsh, or would you like for your child to be called pleasant? 
in the Bible, there were several name changes that took place, uh, like Jacob and Saul, whose name was changed to Paul, and, and several others, Israel. Uh, and, and some of the Bible characters, our heroes that we look at in the Bible, their names were changed. And whether or not it was designed to be that way, many of the Bible changes in their names turned out to be a reflection of, of those people who had become more attached to God and working towards becoming in the image of God. And so I thought of this name change taking place at Mount Pleasant. What would happen if parents said, you know, I want my child to be pleasant. I want everybody to know my child is a pleasant child, not one that's barren and harsh. And so I told you that just to set the theme for what we're going to talk about tonight. Talk about discipling and disciplining our children. Our last message to the men was in discipling our children. Fathers ought to take their children to the side and disciple them in the things of the Lord, disciple them in the things of manhood, disciple them in the training that they ought to have to make a living and be good citizens, discipleship. But the spelling of the word discipline is a little different, isn't it? And so if you're going to discipline your children, <coughs> if you disciple them along with disciplining them, it works a lot better. If they're discipled, that means a follower. You with me? If you, Dad, especially Dad, and Mom as well, if we win our children's heart and they love us and respect us and they're used to following us, then when we discipline them, it's not a a harsh rebuke that causes them to despise us. They know we love them and what we're doing is for, for their best concern. Are you with me? Win their heart. And so we'll talk about that some tonight. Win their heart first so they, that they willingly and consistently respond well to the discipline that sometimes must come. What would you think of a father <clears throat> who was responsible for, what, for, for raising these following boys? One son sexually assaults his half-sister and is murdered by his brother in retaliation. This murdering son goes on to re lead a rebellion against his father and is violently killed as a result. A third son later wages a rebellion against his father and fourth brother the designated heir. Not quite the model family, is it? <laughs> but if you know the Bible a little bit, you know who I'm talking about. King David was a great man, most revered king of all time in Israel. But boy, did he mess up with his family. His boys went haywire. Here's a great man. I mean a great man. Why did his boys go haywire? Why did they turn out to be killers, rapists, people that you wouldn't say very pleasant people? King David was great, but his sons were dunderheads. In fact, if you look at a lot of the heroes of the Bible, like Jacob, Jacob, whose name was later Israel, the father of the children of Israel, the 12 sons. You look at the 12 sons and boy, you won't find much going on there <laughs> with the exception of Joseph. Something went haywire. Jacob was a great man and the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, but boy, his boys were rascals. I mean, they sold Joseph to make a little money off of him and to get rid of him out of their family. <laughs> Something went wrong. A person who is a parent can be a great person and let their family go to the dogs. It is said that Billy Sunday, the great evangelist, who won thousands and thousands to the Lord through his preaching and evangelization, it is said that he let his own children go to hell. Why does this happen? Why did this happen with King David? Why did it happen with Hophni and Phineas, uh, the sons of Eli? 
Eli, the prophet of Israel. He was in a high position over Israel, the priest of Israel. And yet Eli, Eli's sons turned out to be knuckleheads, wicked. Sexual sin so flagrant and shameless, shameful, that it was known all through Israel. Eli, the great man of God, and yet his sons were reprobates. What happens to good people who let their families go downhill? Why does this happen? Were these, were these men not good men? They were. What happened? Maybe, listen, maybe they were so busy trying to save the world and fight armies and lead a nation. Maybe they were so busy in the things they were doing to become great they just didn't have time to take care of their sons and daughters. If we get too busy and we don't have time to raise our kids, we're too busy. Samuel's sons, corrupt. Jehoshaphat, the great king, <clears throat> he made the classic mistake of allowing his son Jehoram to marry the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Can you imagine all these things? These are our heroes in the Bible. And his son, King Manasseh, <laughs> twisted leader with statues of Molech, and the great reformer king, Josiah. Uh, he was the last righteous king because all three of his sons ruled unrighteously. Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. They turned out awful. So here's what I'm saying. If these great heroes in the Bible, great men who did great things, if they could let their kids go to the dogs, don't you think it's possible that you and I could? I think we better learn something that these men missed. And the Bible has it. I, I love the Bible because it doesn't gloss over the sins and shortcomings of other people in the Bible. And it gives it, the New Testament says, for our admonition in the New Testament times. David failed to discipline his sons. The Bible says that, that not at any time did he ever say no to them. David wouldn't say, you can't do that, and mean it. He let them have their own way. Well, our mandate in Genesis chapter 2 Men is to keep the children through loving discipline that preserves them from harm. Now there is harm that comes from the outside and we ought to protect. There's some bad shootings I guess uh, around Cersei last night which is unusual for us here. Uh, it's part of our job men to protect. Somebody's watching the door right now. Several of you are probably armed as you usually would be. We have a law enforcement officer sitting back there with keen eyes who's watching. Why are we doing that? Well, we want to protect. And fathers ought to want to protect their children. And not all harm comes from the outside. Some harm comes from the inside and Perhaps maybe the greatest harm comes from the inside because children are born little sinners. They're not born little angels. See that little guy sitting right back there? <laughs> Erica thinks he's a little angel. He's a little sinner. That's what he is. You know why he is? Because his mother and his dad are sinners and their mothers and dads are sinners. <laughs> David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Not meaning the sexual act, but the fact that we all inherit sin nature. And little babies, as sweet and cuddly and cute as they are, they're born little sinners because we're all sinners. And it's a father's mandate, his calling is to protect that little baby and that child as he gets older from the harm that might come from the outside, but also from the harm that would come from the inside. And that's why we have to discipline them, lovingly discipline them to protect them from the sin that's inside. And when you discipline your children, you're not being hateful and mean. You're protecting them. What is this involved in this call to keep a child's heart anyway? 
My son, give me thine heart. That's what the Bible says. If we gain the heart of the children so that they love and trust us, then when the discipline comes, they will not be as likely to turn away and go another way, but they'll stay connected because they know we care. What do we seek, fathers? Well, we seek obedience from them. Obedience, question, do your children obey? We seek obedience. Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents. We seek obedience. And it's said of Abraham that God said, I, I chose Abraham because he would rule his family well. And men were, you might not like the term rule, but I think that's what is largely wrong in our society today is because fathers don't rule their homes. And too many fathers don't even stay in their homes. And too many fathers allow their family just to go in whatever direction instead of being a ruler, an authority in the home. And we have to have that or we won't have obedient children. Jeremiah 17, uh, 17, 9 says about the heart, what? It's desperately wicked. <laughs> Who can know it? And that's, that goes for all of us. We can't trust our heart. When somebody says, follow your heart, they're a knucklehead. They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> you follow your heart, and you're, you're doing exactly different than what the Bible says you ought to do. You follow God, follow his word, follow his spirit. Discipline. We're looking for obedience. We're Supposed to, Des, and get this, we're supposed to exercise self-control. Are you listening? Fathers, provoke not your children unto wrath. If you discipline in anger, you're probably going to provoke wrath. Now, you're supposed to be an authority. And you can't allow yourself to become wimpy in that authority. You have to exercise your authority. But if you do it out of anger, you're doing it wrong. Provoke not your children unto wrath. If you have a quick temper and you only discipline when your children have driven you nuts and then you've got to get even with them, that's all wrong. You do it with a calm, cool spirit. You say, well, I don't feel calm and cool when I've told them 19 times to quit and they did it again. Well, in the first place, you shouldn't, let them, you shouldn't be telling them 19 times to quit. <laughs> and in the second place, if you're, if you're bent out of shape and you can't do it any other way, you go find your place to sit down and hide out for a little while until you cool off. And then give discipline in a calm and cool, authoritative manner. You have to be under control. If The reason I think our world, our culture thinks that Spanking and discipline of children is such a bad thing is because there's so many parents who do it out of anger and they end up abusing the kids. And that is wrong. But spanking your children, if it's done in the right way, is not abusing them. It's biblical. We're looking for obedience and we're looking for fathers to have self-control. If a parent is out of control, you know what that's going to teach the child? It's going to teach them to be out of control. And they're going to go out and do the crazy things that they learned from you, Father. The way to keep a child's heart. Now, we said you've got to have the child's heart. You've got to have that heart. If you're going to discipline them and be effective, you have to have their heart. You've got to win their heart. They have to love and admire and appreciate you. But you've got to win their heart to get that. There's two main ways when how parents can respond to their sin, the child's sin nature, to correct them and restrain them, and that's through physical punishment and verbal reproof. Two ways. 
See, I said a while ago, everything doesn't, everything shouldn't be a spanking. There is such a thing as verbal reproof, but don't leave out the physical part. There's a time for each, a time for each. I've said this before, and I believe it's, it's, it's absolutely true. The crime ought to fit the punishment. The punishment ought to fit the crime. I mean, if a child does something accidentally, knocks a glass of milk over at the table, that's not the time to fly off the handle and wail the daylights out of them. That was an accident. Now, if they accidentally knock their milk over and you pour them another glass and they slap it off on purpose, then now it's time to do something for the will, to change that will. But you don't fly off the handle over an accident something that was not willful, willful disobedience. That's when punishment comes in. Hebrews 12, 11 says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, nevertheless, listen to this. Nevertheless, chastisement, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness to them which are exercised thereby. Pleasantness. Now there's Mount Pleasant. You see, if they're disciplined in the right way, they'll respond in the right way instead of rebelling and despising their parents. The pleasantness is what comes. Now, it's not pleasant to have to discipline your children. I understand that. I, don't, I think there'd be a weird, really weird, sadistic parent who enjoys spanking their kids. <laughs> I mean, you don't look forward to that. You don't even want to do it. I mean, it's just, it's against a parent's nature to want to have to lower the boom on the kids. But if you're a godly parent and you believe the Bible, you have to do it even though it's unpleasant. It's kind of like, you know, you got a job to do and, you know, your commode gets stopped up. You don't want to have to unplug. Who, who enjoys un unplugging a stopped up commode? <laughs> you're weird if you want to do that. Well, just like you don't look forward to something like that, you don't look forward to disciplining your kids, but you do it because it has to be done. There's physical reproof, sparing not the rod. Do we need to read that scripture that, that says that if we withhold discipline, the rod of correction, we actually hate our children if we don't apply that discipline? You know I like to roast coffee. Roasting coffee, you, you buy unroasted green beans. Now, they're not green beans like <laughs> Italian green beans and French-style green, French green beans, not like that. These are green coffee beans. They're, they're inside of a little... It's, the coffee bean is actually a, a seed that's inside of what they call a cherry. It grows on a bush, and not in our part of the country, but these are in usually high-altitude countries closer to the equator. And coffee grows on a bush, they strip the, uh, that cherry fruit off of the seed, then the seed is just a little green hard seed. And you take that thing and roast it, and it turns brown, and you grind it up, and pour hot water over it, and it makes a really good drink. I, I've always wondered, who was the guy that ever went out there and, and saw those bushes and thought, if I pick these berries off here, strip the fruit, and, and, and roast them till they're black, I bet that'd make a good drink. I don't think, I don't understand that you know but somebody did I'm glad he did but until those beans are roasted they're green hard harsh and have a poor flavor nobody would want to drink coffee made from a green coffee bean you've got to roast them same thing can be said for children They're green, they're hard, and unflavorful till you roast them. <laughs> well, I just thought I'd throw that in. I thought you might think it was funny. By physical punishment, I'm talking about spanking. According to the Bible, spanking our young children is absolutely necessary. Not for no reason, but when it's needed. It's absolutely necessary to restrain their sin. Remember, they have a sin nature. Now, you have one too, but you've grown into adulthood where hopefully 
after being saved and having the Holy Spirit living within you, hopefully you can restrain your sin a little easier than small children who are immature and oftentimes unsaved and they're looking for you to, for guidance. And so you're the adult. You're the one that has to guide them. And the Bible says that we're not to withhold discipline from the child. But apply it whenever it's needed. And spanking renders the child compliant. Now it's kind of in their nature because it was in your nature too, adult. <laughs> it's in your nature. You don't want nobody telling you what to do. You don't want to follow somebody else's rules. You want to make your own. <laughs> but if you don't take time when it's necessary to apply the discipline properly, that rebellion will stay there. It will foment and ferment, and it will grow. And when they get older, they'll be out breaking the law. And you'll have to bail them out of jail. Or you'll have to hire a lawyer to keep them from going to prison. Or you'll be going to visit them in prison if they are unrestrained. So listen, the best thing you can do, if you love your child and you don't want them to end up like the world's kids, you want them to be different. You want them to love you. You want them to love society. You want them to love the Lord. If you want that, then you must get a hold of your emotions and say, the Bible says I must discipline my children when they need it. We must do that. And what is wrong with a lot of our culture is people have given up on disciplining their children and, and they just react. When the child does wrong, they say something wimpy like, well, you ought not to back talk your mother, son. Instead of saying something wimpy like that, you say, you stop that right now. You say, you're not supposed to yell at kids. No, you shouldn't yell at them, but you can sound authoritative. Mommy's little child shouldn't back talk mom. No, that's wimpy. Authoritative says, stop it right now. And if they know you mean business, they'll probably stop it. And if they don't know, you're going to teach them how to know. <laughs> and the next time when you say, stop it right now, they're going to know you mean business. But you know what happened to a lot of these Bible characters? When the child didn't obey... They just sloughed it off and said, oh, well. And they grew up to be reprobates. You can't just slough it off and hope it gets better. I'm begging you, do it the Bible way and say, this doesn't feel good. It hurts my heart, but it's going to hurt your little rear end. <laughs> so it doesn't sound very right. It is very right. It's very biblical. You spank them on the, their little hiney that's got nice padding on it and you do it in such a way that you're not going to hurt them. But it's going to sting. If it doesn't sting, you didn't do the job. You shouldn't have done anything. You know how you provoke wrath? Is when you give them a little... That provokes wrath. It better sting. If, they, if I take a, one of my children, when they were little, if I took them out of the room and took them to discipline them and they came back smiling and everything just all happy and rosy, they didn't get it right. They're going to come back with a broken heart and maybe some tears showing. Now, seek privacy. Listen to this. If you're taking notes, get this down, how to do it. First of all, if you're going to discipline your children, do it privately. First of all, because you don't want to get in the middle of a lawsuit anymore. We've got such a crazy society, they want to sue you for spanking your own kids. So do it privately. But the biggest problem is if we don't do it privately, see, we're not doing it to publicly shame the child. We're not trying to embarrass the child in front of their friends, you know, Go do it privately. Find a private place where you can talk to them the way you really need to. And when you talk to them, number two, not only do you do it privately, but number two, make the offense known. Let them know what they did wrong. You say, I'm all right, I'm going to whoop you. 
What for? You know what for. Bam, bam, bam. No, don't do it that way. Tell them what it's for. Tell them why they're getting the licking. They need to know. Explain the offense. Don't spank a child for an unknown broken rule. You can't just make up the rules. See, provoke not your children to wrath. If you just make up the rules and then spank them right on the spot because they just broke a rule they didn't even know anything about, that's wrong. So instead of having nine gazillion rules, have a short list of rules and enforce them. I said enforce them. It's not hit and miss. A little pun there. Not hit and miss. If you're going to discipline a child for an offense, make sure it is an offense that deserves punishment in the first place. And if it is, do it every time. If they don't know, they do it one day and you let them get by with it, the next day you whoop them, the next day you don't, they never know and they're going to push the boundaries as far as they can. And they're going to be confused as all get out because you're confusing them. Have a short list with a few rules that you stick to instead of having so many they can't possibly remember all of them. And require, number three, that the offense be acknowledged they have to admit that they did wrong. It's kind of like even we adults kind of violate this principle sometimes. Somebody calls our hand, we did something offensive, wrong to them. And they call to our attention and we say, well, we don't really think we did anything. We say, well, if I did do something, I'm sorry. No, not, it's not if I did something. Admit that you did it. <laughs> if you did it, admit it. And the same thing goes for your kids. They have to know that they did something wrong. And you explain it to them and get them to admit that they did wrong. Sinful behavior needs to be pointed out, communicated to them, and then they need to admit that they did it. If they're like, you know, did you get that cookie? Aaron was the worst offender ever. Did you get that cookie? No, not me. He's got cookie crumbs falling down his chest. If they did wrong, get them to admit it. Show them why it's wrong. Then apply the, dis apply the discipline. And what the Bible says is don't, don't pull back. Don't spare for their crying. They'll act like they're dying, but they're not. Go ahead and do it. And then once you apply the discipline, embrace them, hug them, Love them. Let them know that, hey, this is done. You know, don't, don't go away making them think, well, they're still mad at me. Can't do anything to please them. And then they will rebel. Bring them, don't, don't bring them up in wrath, but in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so when they do something wrong, as... The old timers used to say, lick them. <laughs> I give them a licking. But then you hug them. Pray with them. Let them know everything's all right now. If they admitted that they did something wrong. If they didn't admit it, then you're not quite finished yet. And number five, this is a hard one. Repeat it as often as necessary. Did you get that? Now here's where parents, here's where parents go wrong so often. They'll they'll paddle little Johnny, breaks their heart, and so they feel like, boy, I really hated to do that. And next time he does it, you think, you remember how it hurt to have spank him? You say, I'm not going to do it this time because it hurt me. You see, your feelings are about you. Now he's the one. Little Johnny's the one that you need to be consistent with. You're consistent, because, not because of how you feel, but because it's biblical and it's right. Yes. And so when they do the same thing again, be consistent. Do it again as often as necessary. I've said this for years, and I believe it is true. It's better to go to battle for two or three days and win the battle 
than to go through a whole 18 or 20 years or longer and lose the war is right. I mean, if you have to stay up all night for three nights in a row, win the battle. You're the authority. You're the one in charge. You're the one that's been given the mandate from God. You're the one that will answer to God on the day at the judgment seat of Christ how you applied your discipline. Yes, you will. You'll be judged at the judgment seat of Christ for that just as surely as you will if you got drunk occasionally as a Christian. It's your job to be a parent. It's your job not to pull back and say, well, it hurts me too bad to discipline my kids. Do it because then when they get a little bit older you will have won their admiration, respect, and established your authority. Because if you wrestle with them, as I see some parents do occasionally in Walmart (laughs) or a grocery store, parents are chasing those little kids all down the aisle. You come back here, I'm going to get you. And they're running after those little kids. I wouldn't run after them. (laughs) I'd sit down and wait for them to come back. (laughs) And when they come back... They won't run again the next time if we're not consistent and mean business. Love them, but it's your responsibility to do it in the right way, to nurture, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Spanking, when properly conducted, when it's done in the right way, will enable parents then to be more loving to their children. And as they get a little older, then when they become teenagers, you'll still have their love and respect and admiration instead of being at war with them all through their teen years. (laughs) By the way, let me just take a little side note here. If you let them act and dress and talk the way they please when they're little, what makes you think you'll be able to correct that when they get to be 13 or 16 years old? You let those little girls dress like a harlot when they're little, they'll dress like a harlot when they're a teenager. And they'll attract boys for the wrong reason. You let boys backtalk their mother and talk hateful to their mother when they're little, you just wait till they get to be a teenager. You're not going to change it then. No, you won't. (laughs) It won't work. We can't be like King David and be afraid to be the authority over our children. Just have to do it. <clears throat> spanking, regardless of what our society says, our spanking is not immoral or abusive. It's biblical. God didn't make a mistake. I've seen kids on airplanes before that had that whole airplane in uproar. One little toddler... And everybody on the airplane sitting there going, oh, no, why didn't the parent do something? Well, the parent waits till they get on the airplane to try to do something. You should have done it at home. You can't wait till you get in the restaurant or on the airplane. You've got to do it at home. Train them every day. Get those little rascals up and set them on the sofa and say, we're going to sit here and uh, mom or dad, we're We're going to tell a story or we're going to teach something from the Bible, but we're going to sit still for 10 minutes and nobody's going to move. If they don't sit still at home, they're not going to sit still at the restaurant. And if they weep and wail and act like Tarzan the ape man at home, they climb on the kitchen cabinets, jump all over the beds and tear the bedroom apart, Leave their toys scattered all through the house? (laughs) At home? What do you think they're going to do when they get to the neighbor's house? When you go visiting? Are you going to do it there? I'm saying saying it has to be taught at home or it ain't going to work out there. Fatherly discipline. Now there's verbal reproof. We didn't talk about that. But sometimes you just got to express your authority, Dad. Verbally, it doesn't always. Sometimes there might have been a miscommunication, ignorance of a rule or something, and it might not warrant a spanking. It could be a first warning. 
something that you hadn't already talked about, then you give a verbal reproof. But don't do the list of little wimpy reproof. Do it authoritatively. You're the parent. You have to establish your authority. And if you just always ask their permission, say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a bath and put you to bed now, okay? No, you don't ask them, okay? You're not, you're not supposed to ask the child for permission to do what you're supposed to do as a parent. It's not okay. It's like, no, you're going to get your bath and you're going to go to bed. See how that works? <laughs> yeah. Some of you are looking like a calf looking at a new gate. Thank you. I'm glad you're on my side, Brother Lord. <laughs> Sometimes it gets lonesome up here. Some, when you don't want to... When you don't want to apply discipline to your children, I know how that feels because sometimes I have to preach messages that I'd rather not preach, to be honest with you. But I'd be dishonest and violating my call to God if I didn't preach those messages that I didn't want to preach. I didn't want to, but I got to because he said to. And you have to as a parent because God said so. Well... We're out of time. Let me give you this last thing. Number three, advice on application. <clears throat> Talking about keeping, the mandate of keeping the children by discipline. Dad, I will give you a little bit of advice here. Dad, be the bad cop. You know what that means. Do I need to have Connor to explain this? <laughs> Good cop, bad cop. Look, mom's been at home all day long trying to corral the little rascals. She wants to love them, but she's had to be, she's had to be the one to keep them under control all day. Now, if you come home, Dad, and you try to be the good cop, you're going to be the loving daddy. You're not going to, you're not going to talk authoritatively to them. You're not going to spank them. You're not going to tell them no. You know how that makes your wife feel? All day long I've been washing dishes and doing laundry and picking up after these kids and trying to, trying to make them act like human beings and then dad comes home and he gets to be the good guy. That makes your wife feel like, you're a dirty rat, you ran out on me. Dad, when you come home, you be the bad guy, you be the bad cop. Let mom be the good cop. Now she's still going to be a cop, but she's going to be the good cop for a while. And dad, you come home and you take care of business. You love them, but if they're out of line, you straighten them out. Don't come home and expect everything just to be rosy and happy times for you when mom's done all the discipline all day long. Be the bad cop. That's for dads. See, I'm trying to help you out, ladies. <laughs> here's, here's one you got to remember. Maintain a sense of humor. <laughs> Maintain a sense of humor. Everything can't be stern and strict and mean all the time. I'm not saying let down on the rules, but I'm just saying if there's a lighthearted atmosphere in the home, it makes things go a lot better. There's a playful attitude, a spirit of happiness, pleasant. Remember that word? Mount Pleasant. Pleasantness. You know why some, and sometimes some of us preachers, maybe we go overboard a little bit with trying to be funny sometimes, but you know why we do that in a sermon? Well, partially because it, sometimes it illustrates a point we're trying to make, but sometimes it's just to kind of give a, a breath of relief, a pleasantness to the atmosphere. You don't mind that, do you? I mean, I'm not saying preachers ought to be comedians. I'm just saying that once in a while to say something a little bit lighthearted, a little bit funny, just kind of takes the edge off of the atmosphere. And in home, it ought to be kind of like that to the nth degree. I'm talking about being pleasant, not being an old ogre, you know. It's not like the kids all running to hide behind the door when Dad comes home. They want to know you love them. They won't know you care for them. Be a little bit happy. <laughs> Don't be a no meanie. 
Discipline them when it needs to be done, but for the most part, be pleasant and happy. You don't have to be a, an old grump like me. <laughs> Just be happy and pleasant. Maintain a sense of humor, lightheartedness. And then the kids will recognize, listen to this, if it's kind of lighthearted in the home, then when they do something wrong and you have to show your authority, they can instantly see the difference. They say, oh, Dad's not kidding now. It ought not to be a thing of where you're mean around the clock. Be lighthearted, but when it comes time to discipline, be the authoritarian, and they can say, uh-oh, this is getting serious, and they see that you mean business. And do not provoke your children. Be fair and judicious. Be fair. And even in the same family, look, some, t some families have two or more children, several children. And you want to be fair with them. But that doesn't mean <laughs> that they can all be treated exactly the same in discipline because some kids are more easily and treated than others. They have a tender heart. And so some kids may require more discipline. That doesn't mean you're being unfair, but don't be unfair in the sense that it's obvious that you've got favorites or that you lower the boom on one and you never touch the other. <laughs> don't have to... I mean, if one never does much wrong, you know, they might not need as much discipline, but... Be fair, and when they do need it, do it. Be fair and judicious. And then last, bathe it all in prayer. If a parent doesn't know that this is a serious business and it needs God's help and doesn't bathe it in prayer, they don't understand much about parenting. It's going to take God's spirit to make sure it works it's going to take some time in prayer to make sure it works be the parent be loving but be the authoritarian in your home let's pray together father we love you and thank you for your special concern for us we're your children and lord we know that you're fair and yet you chastise us when we're wrong Lord, help our parents to be able to communicate that to their children, that when it's time for discipline, that it will happen. The rest of the time, we're enjoying our lives together as a family. Lord, help us to be good parents. Help the children to be good children to their parents and to love their parents. Lord, I pray that you bless our church. Bless this invitation in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Would you stand?